You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, y'all. Spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. Hey, everyone. This is Rich. And Tracy. And before we get back to Stonewall Jackson, we just wanted to give a plug for joining the Strawfoot Brigade. Some of you may hear us mention it all the time, but wonder just what this strange group is that we keep referring to. Well, it's the membership program that we started about a year ago that gives y'all the opportunity to help support the podcast while also getting two extra episodes to listen to each month. Yeah, basically you go to the show's website, www.civilwarpodcast.org, and sign up through PayPal to make recurring payments of $5 a month, and that registers you as a member of the Strawfoot Brigade. And like Tracy said, it's our goal to release two of those members' episodes each month. Uh, But besides getting those extra episodes, membership is also just a great way for you to help support what we're doing here with this podcast about the Civil War. Just this weekend, we released members' episode number 27, which was the fourth and final installment in the New Orleans story arc. And then next month, we plan on having a couple of extra episodes about Stonewall Jackson. Right. And Old Stonewall is one fascinating character, uh, but really all 27 members episodes so far have been really interesting stuff that Tracy and I find fascinating and um, hope that you guys do also. But besides that extra content, uh, for those of you who have already joined up, we also appreciate, more than we can say, your support of the podcast through your membership in the Strawfoot Brigade. And if you've been thinking of joining, we just wanted to point out that this is a great time to do it, with uh, 27 extra shows of the podcast there just waiting for you to listen to them. Welcome to the 140th episode of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. When we left off the last episode, it was November 5th, 1861, and 37-year-old Major General Thomas Jonathan Jackson had just arrived at Winchester, Virginia, to take command of Confederate forces in the Shenandoah Valley. Stonewall Jackson once insisted in a letter to a friend that, quote, if this valley is lost, Virginia is lost, end quote. And it was widely supposed that if Virginia were lost, it would signal the death knell of the Confederacy. Whatever the validity of those beliefs, the Shenandoah Valley was of vital strategic importance to both sides in the Civil War, and the authorities in Washington, as well as Richmond, were well aware of that fact. In Confederate hands, the valley was a spear thrusting into the flank of the Union's eastern front. The valley terminated on the Potomac River, 30 miles northwest of Washington, D.C., and so threatened the capital menacingly. So long as the Shenandoah Valley was controlled by Confederate forces, federal authorities in Washington, and even Pennsylvania, would remain restless and apprehensive about their security. The flip side of that same coin was that if the Shenandoah were to fall into Union hands, not only would the abundance of foodstuffs produced by the fertile farms of the valley be lost to the Confederacy, 
But rebel forces in the Piedmont region of Virginia, east of the Blue Ridge Mountains, would stand in constant danger of federal attacks through any of the numerous passes that cut through the mountains from the Shenandoah. And in the valley's upper or southern reaches, a Union force in control of Stanton would threaten the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, which was an enormously important east-west link between Richmond and Chattanooga. Keeping the Shenandoah under Confederate control and exploiting it as a threat to the Union would be Stonewall Jackson's mission for the next seven months of his life. On the scale of the grand campaigns of the Civil War, Jackson's Valley Campaign would be minuscule. His army would never number more than 17,000 men, and its few pitched battles taken together wouldn't compare in size or casualties to such major clashes as Fair Oaks or Shiloh. But the Valley Campaign enshrined Jackson as one of the Confederacy's great military captains, because using a brilliant mix of speed, maneuver, and cunning, Stonewall and his foot cavalry marched hundreds of miles to deliver shattering blows to three separate Union armies. And thanks largely to this diversion out in the valley, George McClellan's seemingly unstoppable drive on Richmond was temporarily but crucially paralyzed and the Confederate capital was saved. When Stonewall Jackson arrived in Winchester in early November 1861, he found a situation not at all to his liking. His Army of the Valley faced 18,000 Federals, commanded by Major General Nathaniel P. Banks, holding Western Maryland along the line of the Potomac. In addition, more than 22,000 Yankees, led by Brigadier General William S. Rosecrans, were positioned in Western Virginia, just across the Alleghenies. And, of most immediate concern, Brigadier General Benjamin F. Kelly and his 5,000 Federals had recently captured the village of Romney, posing a threat to Jackson's western flank and even to his headquarters. The aggressive Kelly pointed out to his superiors that, quote, From here to Winchester it is 40 miles, by the northwestern turnpike, a very fine road. Should you desire to strike an offensive blow on Winchester, this is the place to concentrate, end quote. To counter the enemy forces arrayed around him, Stonewall Jackson had pitifully few resources. Scattered about in detachments of infantry and cavalry, there were 1,650 militiamen, mostly armed with converted flintlock muskets and desperately short of ammunition. The largest group, numbering about 440, was stationed in Winchester. In addition, Jackson could call upon some 485 undisciplined cavalry under Colonel Angus MacDonald, a 60-year-old Southern patriot whose ailments would soon force him to retire in favor of his second-in-command, Lieutenant Colonel Ashby Turner. Finally, Jackson's army possessed a grand total of two artillery pieces, which the gunners did not even know how to load and fire. On his first day in command, Jackson did what little he could. He ordered his dispersed detachments of militiamen to concentrate at Winchester. He issued a call for all valley militia not already in the field to assemble and report for duty. And he dispatched his adjutant, Colonel J.T.L. Preston, to Richmond to warn the War Department that at present the Shenandoah Valley was, quote, defenseless. In fact, the weakness of the valley defenses was so obvious that it had even been recognized by the Confederate Secretary of War, Judah P. Benjamin, whose ignorance of military matters was surpassed only by his loyalty to Jefferson Davis. At any rate, even before Preston arrived, Benjamin had decided to send Jackson the Stonewall Brigade, which the general had so recently left. Jackson quickly concocted ambitious plans for his meager reinforcements. It was typical of this indomitable warrior that he meant to use them, not to conduct a static defense of the valley, but to attack the enemy at the first opportunity. But Jackson's plans were unrealistic. During the next five months, Stonewall would have to retreat often, not only from the enemy, but also from positions he took in quarrels with fellow officers. His worst military defeat, coming at the end of this time period, would drive him from the field near a village named Kernstown. 
Yet through all the trials and tribulations, one thing was constant. Jackson never wavered in his resolve to strike at and do terrible damage to the enemy forces arrayed against him. A little more than two weeks after he took command, Jackson announced his intent to strike at the enemy in a letter to Judah Benjamin. The letter, dated November 20th, revealed Jackson's strategic vision and forecast his valley campaign. An offensive movement in the valley, Jackson reasoned, might deceive the federal authorities into thinking he had been reinforced by a portion of Joe Johnston's troops from the Manassas Centerville front, and believing that, even the cautious George McClellan might be tempted to attack Johnston's supposedly weakened army there in northeastern Virginia. Should McClellan so move, then Jackson said that the Valley Army would turn from whatever it was doing and rush to Johnston's aid. In short, the Confederate victory at First Manassas might be repeated. But Jackson's plan didn't end with McClellan's defeat. Stonewall argued that afterward his troops could return to the valley and then move rapidly into the rugged mountains of western Virginia and liberate that region from its federal occupiers. Jackson declared that, quote, I deem it of very great importance that northwestern Virginia be occupied by Confederate troops this winter. Such were Stonewall's long-range goals. His immediate objective was to recapture Romney and secure his western flank. The little mountain town of Romney was the key to securing the fertile valley of the Potomac's south branch. Through Romney passed the turnpike to Winchester, as well as a road that ran southwest through the Alleghenies to Monterey, intersecting there with a vital highway from Stanton to Parkersburg on the Ohio River. Arcing around Romney, about 20 miles away from the town, was a 60-mile stretch of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, previously put out of commission by rebel raids, but now being repaired by federal work crews. Retaking Romney, as Jackson wrote to his superiors, would drive a wedge between the Federals and the Alleghenies and Nathaniel Banks' force, thus preventing them from joining forces. To set his scheme in motion, Jackson would need help, and he knew just what he wanted. The little Confederate Army of the Northwest, presently commanded by Brigadier General William W. Loring, after taking part in a dismal campaign in the mountains under the direction of Robert E. Lee, was now doing little more in the Alleghenies than guarding the Stanton-Parkersburg Turnpike. When Jackson wrote to Judah Benjamin of his plan, he said, quote, through the blessing of God, who has thus far so wonderfully prospered our cause, much more may be expected from General Loring's troops than can be expected from them where they are. Both Stonewall's immediate superior, Joe Johnston, and Judah Benjamin endorsed the operation to recapture Romney, though Johnston thought that Jackson's plan, quote, proposes more than can well be accomplished, end quote. But Benjamin nevertheless set about making arrangements for the transfer of Loring's troops to the valley. Benjamin handled the matter with discretion, which was well advised, since William Wing Loring, who had lost his left arm in Mexico at Chapultepec, was a touchy fellow. He had clearly been unhappy earlier when Jefferson Davis had sent Robert E. Lee out to northwestern Virginia to oversee operations in the mountains and Loring had vented his displeasure by conducting all his movements as slowly as possible. Knowing that the touchy brigadier required careful handling, Judah Benjamin, in presenting Jackson's plan to Loring, merely expressed the hope that the Army of the Northwest would join Stonewall. Loring thought the matter over, then consented, but on his own terms. He wanted it understood that he would require two or possibly three weeks of, quote, unquote, the greatest exertion to get his force ready to march. Moreover, he would bring with him only three of his four brigades, about 6,000 men, and leave behind the command of Edward Johnson to guard the passes through the Alleghenies. Stonewall Jackson had little choice but to wait for Loring before commencing his move against Romney. Meanwhile, he sought other occupations for his restless men, who were chafing at the boredom and artificial disciplines of camp life. (music) 
As Jackson waited on Loring, a special problem was posed by the Stonewall Brigade, whose mood had changed radically since the veteran troops had learned in early November that they were to rejoin their general. At the news, Private John Castler had written, quote, Then there was joy in camp, end quote. The soldiers, who had nearly all enlisted from the valley, were happy at the thought of returning to their beloved Shenandoah, and they looked forward to enjoying the hospitality of family and friends. But they were swiftly disillusioned. Arriving at Winchester on November 12th, the men of the Stonewall Brigade were marched straight to an encampment about four and a half miles to the north of town. Furloughs were forbidden, Winchester was placed off limits, and Jackson set up a cordon of militiamen to enforce his edicts. Even officers were denied entry into Winchester unless they could show passes from Jackson's headquarters. The weather made things even worse for the unhappy men. An unusually bitter spell of wintry weather blew in, and cold rain and sleet pelted the soldiers' tents as they huddled inside. Worn down by the cold and forced to stay in close quarters, Sickness, especially measles, was soon widespread among the disgruntled troops of the Stonewall Brigade. Jackson countered the spreading illness and grumbling in characteristic fashion. His wife Anna noted that, quote, He remembered the saying of Napoleon that an active winter's campaign is less liable to produce disease than a sedentary camp life in winter quarters, end quote. The march against Romney was Stonewall's main remedy, but until Loring's creeping columns arrived, he decided to occupy his men with another operation that would entail striking at a different target that lay close at hand. Extending for 185 miles alongside the Potomac River from Cumberland, Maryland to Washington was the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, capable of handling barges with loads weighing up to 100 tons. With the B&O tracks broken, the Federals depended heavily on the canal to provide their eastern cities with Appalachian coal. Stonewall Jackson decided to cut this supply artery near Martinsburg at Dam No. 5, one of a series of dams that regulated the depth of the canal waters. He set out before dawn on Monday, December 16, 1861, with the Stonewall Brigade, a militia brigade, and the Rock Bridge Artillery. And the Rockbridge Artillery was a rather remarkable unit, for its original muster role included 25 theology students and 35 college graduates, including seven with master's degrees. By dusk the next day, Tuesday, Jackson's forces were peering over the bluffs of the Potomac's south shore at the site of their objective. That night, 30 volunteers from the 27th Virginia descended the bluffs and managed to put up a brush screen that, it was hoped, would conceal the approach of the main body of troops. Their work done before dawn, the men returned to their comrades, who had shivered the night away since Stonewall had banned campfires. Despite these precautions, the Federals across the way spotted the Confederates and began a lively bombardment from the Maryland side of the river. Private George Neese, a rebel gunner under enemy shelling for the first time, later said, quote, I laid so close to the ground that it seemed to me I flattened out a little. For the next few days, Jackson and his men holed up during the daylight hours and worked by night, waist-deep in the frigid waters, as they labored with crowbars, picks, and axes to tear a hole in the dam. Several times the men came under renewed fire from the Maryland shore. As a decoy, Jackson sent his militia brigade upriver with orders to attract as much attention as possible. The Federals followed, and Stonewall's wrecking crew, now free to work, finally succeeded in breaching the dam. On the march back to Winchester, Jackson may have allowed himself a smile of satisfaction at the results of his outing. But just a smile, for he rarely laughed. And when he did, it was a soundless grimace that made it obvious, as an aide wrote, that, quote, he had never laughed enough to learn how, end quote. In any case, the last laugh in the matter of Dam No. 5 belonged to the Federals, because for all the Confederates' trouble, the damage they did was repaired within two days.
History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. When Stonewall Jackson returned to Winchester on December 23rd, he found that only one of Loring's brigades, under the command of Colonel William B. Tolliver, had yet arrived in town. The others were still dawdling along the way. Indeed, one brigade stopped near Strasburg on Christmas Day and imbibed so much eggnog that when the men were ordered to resume their march, some of them collapsed in the road. Not until December 26 were all of Loring's men at Winchester, bringing the total of Jackson's force to 7,500 Confederate soldiers, 2,200 militia, and 650 cavalry. On December 29th, the persistent cold loosened its grip on the region, and on New Year's Eve, Jackson issued his marching orders. Included in the orders were instructions for all men to carry three-inch-wide white bands to wear around their hats and caps to aid in identifying friend from foe during the chaos and confusion of battle. At six o'clock the next morning, the orders said, the columns would step out toward an undisclosed destination. And so, on New Year's Day, 1862, Jackson's tiny army sallied forth. As one man recalled, the day was, quote, spring-like in its mildness, end quote and the troops behaved, at first, as if they were on a lark. They worked up a bit of sweat, and many of them unburdened themselves of overcoats and even blankets, either depositing them in company wagons or simply dropping them alongside the road. Then, suddenly, the fair weather turned foul. A chilling wind came whistling out of the northwest, the temperature plunged, snow and sleet fell, and the shivering men began wishing for the gear they had so casually discarded. But the supply wagons had fallen behind the columns of infantry, and so for hundreds of men there would be no great coats to warm them on the road or blankets to huddle beneath that night. To Jackson, who was always seeking to mystify and confuse the enemy as to his intentions, the best route between two points was rarely a straight line. Instead of taking the fine turnpike that went directly to Romney, he headed northwest on a rough, wagon-rutted road that led to the mineral water resort of Bath, 35 miles northeast of Romney and about 40 miles from Winchester. The weather continued to worsen, and the struggling army made only eight miles that day. That night, the shivering men shared what blankets they had with them and slept fitfully, huddled together in what one private called, quote, hog fashion. The next morning, the tired and cold men set out into a thickening blizzard. Toward the end of the day's wretched march, some of Loring's regiments became hopelessly tangled up while trying to cross an ice-covered bog. 
Worse yet, the supply wagons fell even farther behind, and since most of the men, in the rash manner of inexperienced troops, had long since consumed their marching rations, hunger pains were now added to their miseries. For the second successive day, the army covered barely eight miles, halting for the night at a place called Unger's Store. That night, a soldier who pulled sentry duty later recalled that, quote, the soles of the shoes actually froze to the ground, end quote. On the morning of January 3rd, Jackson deliberately bypassed a crossroad at Unger's store that led west through Bloomery Gap to Romney. Instead, he kept the troops marching on toward Bath. The resort town was held by 1,400 Federals, who might conceivably attack the right flank of any Confederate move against Romney from the east. Jackson meant to end that potential threat before attacking Romney. At the very least, he would drive the Federals at Bath back across the Potomac. At best, he hoped to trap and capture the entire enemy force, then cross the river to destroy a Federal supply depot at Hancock, Maryland, and to cut the telegraph line between Romney and Western Maryland. The day's march was an ordeal for the hungry, cold, and tired men. Colonel Tolliver began the day by deliberately heading his brigade in the wrong direction, that is, back toward the supply wagons. His troops slipped and slithered back across the frozen bog that had given them so much trouble the day before, and after eating, they were so weary from their exertions that they required two hours of rest before retracing their steps once again. During one of the many delays that day, the increasingly ill-tempered Loring exploded. He was so infuriated by an order from Jackson to keep his men moving that he announced to one and all around him, By God, sir, this is the damnedest outrage ever perpetrated in the annals of history, keeping my men out here in the cold without food. That same day, Jackson had an unpleasant encounter with his successor as commander of the Stonewall Brigade, Brigadier General Richard B. Garnett. To almost everyone but Jackson, Garnett seemed just what a soldier ought to be. The son of an aristocratic family from the Virginia Tidewater, he was a West Pointer whose cousin, Robert Garnett, had been the first Confederate general to be killed during the Civil War. One of the pre-war U.S. Army's boldest Indian fighters, Dick Garnett was a handsome man with dark wavy hair and a neatly trimmed beard, and he looked after his men well, so well that Jackson thought he coddled them. Now Jackson's suspicion seemed confirmed. About ten miles short of Bath, when the Stonewall Brigade's wagons at long last caught up with the column, Garnett ordered a halt to feed the famished men, some of whom had not eaten in thirty hours. At that point, Jackson rode up and asked angrily why the brigade had stopped. I've halted to let the men cook their rations, Garnett explained. There is no time for that, snapped Jackson. But it is impossible for the men to march further without them, said Garnett. I never found anything impossible with this brigade, Jackson said, then rode away. But it boded ill for the men of the Valley Army that Stonewall never forgave Garnett. At dusk, Jackson finally arrived outside Bath. There he learned from locals that a road ran westward from the town across a massive ridge named Warm Spring Mountain. To cut off enemy troops who might try to escape in that direction, which would take them toward Romney, Jackson sent his militia off on a march around the southern flank of the mountain. Then he ordered one of Loring's brigades, under Colonel William Gillum, to drive straight into Bath. The march around Warm Spring Mountain would have been a difficult maneuver for veteran troops, even under ideal conditions, but trekking through the rugged, wintry landscape proved beyond the capabilities of the cold and tired militiamen. They were stopped in their tracks by a few trees the Federals had felled across their path. The brigade under Colonel Gillum didn't do much better. Gillum was, quite literally, a textbook commander. He had been an instructor of infantry tactics at VMI while Jackson was there and had written a book titled Manual of Instruction for the Volunteers and Militia of the United States. After the start of the Civil War, new editions of the manual substituted Confederate States for United States in the title. 
now that an opportunity had arisen for Gillum to put his classroom knowledge into real-world practice, he moved timidly toward Bath, brushed up against some federal skirmishers, and recoiled as if bitten. When Jackson sent instructions for Gillum to charge forward as if he meant it, Loring countermanded the order. Thus a bad day ended on a dismal note. Next day, the militia tried again on the west side of Warm Spring Mountain, but the waiting Federals took them by surprise and sent them scampering. Gillum, moving again toward Bath, stopped a half mile from the town when he saw enemy troops on the mountain. With the morning and early afternoon wasted, Jackson impatiently sent his cavalry galloping straight into Bath under one of his staff officers. Stonewall himself followed close after the horsemen, and as he wrote in a scathing report of the action, quote, entered the town in advance of the skirmishers under Gillum. Much to Jackson's irritation, the Federal infantry was gone, having withdrawn from Bath without interference, some across the mountain to the west and others northward across the Potomac to Hancock. By the time Jackson had reached the Potomac in pursuit, Darkness was falling, and he could do no more than lob a few shells at Hancock from the two guns he had managed to bring up. Next morning, he sent an emissary across the river and into the town under a flag of truce to demand that Hancock be surrendered within the hour. It was a bold bluff by Jackson, and when the federal commander understandably declined to give up to an enemy that hadn't even managed to cross the river yet, Stonewall briefly bombarded the town then ordered a bridge constructed across the Potomac a few miles upriver. On January 6th, however, Jackson changed his mind about attacking Hancock, reporting that the town's garrison was reinforced, quote, to such an extent as to induce me to believe that my object could not be accomplished without a sacrifice of life that I felt unwilling to make, end quote. Next morning, he set his men in motion back toward Unger's store and the crossroad to Romney. The dreadful march was one that the troops would remember for the rest of their days. As they moved along a road that was little more than a treacherous sheet of ice covered by six inches of snow, the temperature plummeted and kept dropping until it reached about 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Lurching ahead on numbed and oftentimes frostbitten feet, the men slipped and fell time and again. One of them remembered the sound of his comrades, quote, hitting the road with a thud like that of a pile driver. The army's horses were in even greater distress, for Jackson, with the failure of foresight that was unusual for him, had neglected to order the animals roughshod for winter travel. Private Castler saw, quote, one horse in each team down nearly all the time. As soon as one would get up, another would be down, and sometimes all four at once, end quote. An artilleryman later recalled that, quote, from one of the horse's knees there were icicles of blood which reached nearly to the ground. Jackson was everywhere. On at least one occasion, he put his shoulder to the wheel of a wagon to help prevent it from sliding back down an icy slope. But he showed little sympathy for his army in its ordeal, and he drove it on. By the time the army struggled into Unger's store on January 8th, it was in woeful condition. One brigade reported 500 men sick, another reported 300 sick. With his ranks thus depleted, and with the snow and sleet continuing, Jackson had no option but to wait at Unger's store while the men rested and farriers reshod the horses. And so there he stayed for four days. Finally, on January 13th, his cavalry reported that the Yankees, against all expectations, and after wildly overestimating Jackson's strength, had abandoned Romney. The trek from Unger's store to Romney, undertaken in driving sleet, was yet another ordeal. An infantryman recalled that when the Stonewall Brigade arrived late on January 14th, quote, every soldier's clothing was a solid cake of ice, and there were icicles two inches long hanging from the hair and whiskers of every man. Loring's brigades took two days longer to reach Romney. In the wretched conditions, one regiment managed to make only 500 yards in a day. Unaccustomed to Jackson's ways, 
and enraged by the suffering to which he had subjected them, Loring's men jeered and hissed Stonewall when he rode among them. Jackson would soon give Loring's grumbling troops further cause for unhappiness. Jackson reported with some satisfaction that the entire Romney expedition had cost him only four men killed and 28 wounded. Having accomplished his mission, he now prepared to take up winter quarters. One militia brigade would be stationed at Bath to guard against a federal crossing from Hancock. Another would be posted at Martinsburg on the lookout for an enemy incursion from that direction. Loring's brigade would remain at Romney to ensure the security of the South Branch Valley, and the Stonewall Brigade would return with Jackson to Winchester, where it would be within supporting distance of all the outposts. But the arrangements didn't sit well with Loring's already unhappy men. Despite the beauty of the rugged surroundings, Romney was an inhospitable, cheerless place, and to make matters worse, a powerful stench arose from the courthouse where the departing Yankees had left tons of rotting meat. On January 25th, two days after Jackson had departed for Winchester, 11 of Loring's brigade and regimental commanders signed a petition and gave it to Loring. It said, quote, Instead of finding, as expected, a little repose during midwinter, we are ordered to remain at this place. Our position at and near Romney is one of the most disagreeable and unfavorable that could well be imagined. End quote. One of the officers who signed the petition, Colonel Samuel Fulkerson of the 37th Virginia, also wrote a note of complaint to a politician friend in Richmond. He declared that, quote, This place is of no importance in a strategical point of view. We have not been in as uncomfortable a place since we entered the service, end quote. Fulkerson showed his letter to Colonel Tolliver, who added a poisonous postscript saying, quote, The best army I ever saw has been destroyed by bad marches and bad management. It is ridiculous. It will be suicidal to keep this command here. End quote. When Loring received his subordinate's petition, he wrote a covering note saying it described, quote, the true condition of this army, end quote. And then he sent it through proper channels to Jackson's headquarters. Jackson duly sent it on to the War Department with a notation, quote, respectfully forwarded but disapproved. To ensure that his officers' complaints received a proper hearing in Richmond, Loring broke with protocol and went over Jackson's head. He gave Colonel Tolliver, who was about to depart for Richmond on leave, a copy of the petition and asked him to hand it personally to Jefferson Davis. Tolliver did so, showing Davis on a map the location of Loring's force. The president, Tolliver wrote later, quote, did not hesitate to say at once that Jackson had made a mistake, and he ordered the concentration of the troops at Winchester by telegraph that same morning, end quote. An order changing Jackson's tactical dispositions was sent through and signed by Secretary of War Judah Benjamin alleging that intelligence indicated a federal force was moving to cut off Loring's command, the instructions stated plainly, quote, order him back to Winchester immediately, end quote. Upon receipt of the order, Jackson dutifully recalled Loring's command to Winchester. Then Stonewall asked to be relieved of active duty. He wrote to Benjamin saying, quote, with such interference, I cannot expect to be of much service in the field, and accordingly respectfully request to be ordered to report for duty to the superintendent of the Virginia Military Institute at Lexington. Should this application not be granted, I respectfully request that the President will accept my resignation from the Army. The letter was dispatched to Jackson's immediate superior, Joe Johnston, for forwarding to Richmond. A dismayed Johnston held on to it for several days in hopes of saving Jackson's career. He wrote to Stonewall, saying, My dear friend, let me beg you to reconsider this matter. Pointing out that he too had been bypassed by Benjamin's order to Jackson, Johnston asked, Is not that as great an official wrong to me as the order itself is to you? Let us dispassionately reason with the government on the subject of command. 
When Johnston received no reply to his overture to his angry subordinate, he decided he had no choice but to send Jackson's request on to Richmond. He wrote, Respectfully forwarded with great regret. I don't know how the loss of this officer can be supplied. Meanwhile, Stonewall proved he himself was not above playing politics. On the same day he dispatched his official request to Benjamin through Johnston, he had sent an unofficial explanation to his friend and neighbor from Lexington days, Virginia Governor John Letcher. Jackson told the governor, quote, A single order like that of the secretaries may destroy the entire fruits of a campaign. If I ever acquired, through the blessing of Providence, any influence over troops, this undoing of my work by the secretary may greatly diminish that influence. End quote. Letcher went at once to Judah Benjamin's office. He found the Secretary of War uncomfortable at the stir he had caused and willing to discuss the Jackson matter. Exactly what terms were proposed for a reconciliation with Jackson remain unknown, but it's certain that the governor was authorized to communicate them to Stonewall. Letcher chose as his emissary another old friend of Jackson's, Confederate, Con Confederate Congressman Alexander R. Bottler. The details of Bottler's meeting with Jackson were never described by either man, but it is known that Bottler appealed strongly to Jackson's Southern patriotism, and it's possible that he relayed some sort of a promise from Benjamin not to interfere again in Jackson's legitimate exercise of command. At any event, Jackson finally acquiesced, writing to Governor Letcher and authorizing him to withdraw the resignation. The dispute was not quite over, however. On the day after he agreed to remain at his post, Jackson formally charged Loring with neglect of duty and with conduct subversive of good order and military discipline. But Jefferson Davis didn't permit Loring to be brought before a court-martial board. Instead, Loring was promoted to Major General and transferred to Georgia. With Loring out of the way, Jackson settled down to what his wife, who had come to stay with him in Winchester, called, quote, as happy a winter as ever falls to the lot of mortals on this earth, end quote. That blissful state, though, was soon brought to an end by the Federal Army in the person of General Nathaniel P. Banks. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Intimate Strategies of the Civil War, Military Commanders and Their Wives, edited by Carol K. Blesser and Leslie J. Gordon. For this book, Blesser and Gordon uh, assembled an impressive array of scholars and biographers to explore the marriages of six Confederate and six Union commanders. Uh, there are the Davises and Lees, of course, and the Grants, and interestingly, the Shermans. Uh, and then Thomas and Anna Jackson are the subject of the third chapter. But we think you guys will enjoy this entire collection of really fascinating essays, which paint remarkably revealing portraits of these Civil War commanders. So that's Intimate Strategies of the Civil War, Military Commanders and Their Wives, and it's published by Oxford University Press. You can find all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. And we have a few new members of the Strawfoot Brigade to thank this week. Michael E., Kyle B., Joel S., Jeff P., Ian J., and Eric B. And Eric, thanks also for the five-star review on Swedish iTunes. We've heard from a few Swedish listeners, which, with a last name like Youngdahl, always makes me happy, since it was my great-great-grandfather Nels who came over to America from Sweden. Switching gears from Scandinavia to Louisiana, Rich and I wanted to be sure to give a special shout-out to listener Brandon B. of New Orleans for his special Mardi Gras gift. Thanks so much, Brandon. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope you'll join us again next time when we'll look at the March 1862 Battle of Kernstown. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.